Good evening, viewers. Uh, very well, warm welcome to the third episode of uh, Introduction to Accountancy with uh, Rahat Kazmi. Um, my name is Tosif uh, Server, and I'm your regular host, uh, which we do a series of uh, different um, online courses, as well as interviews and uh, latest news about the dropshipping and uh, digital marketing. Uh, today, as you know, that we have um, already hosted two episodes of uh, of introduction to the accountancy. But uh, before I start the regular um, uh, online streaming with uh, the corporate trainer, Mr. Rahat Ghazmi, I wanted to share some thoughts about pandemic, which, uh, which according to the latest uh, statistics, the second wave is uh, on uh, on the corner or on the, on the watch of becoming more dangerous uh, around Europe as well as in Asia. Now, uh, the cases in United Kingdom and Ireland are on the rise uh, for last couple of weeks. And in fact, in the United Kingdom, I was just uh, viewing the sky uh, news that they are the highest uh, at the moment since the March of this year. So um, we have some lesson to learn here, a couple of lessons, in fact, to learn here. And one of the lesson uh, we need to learn um, beforehand is that this uh, pandemic disease, we need to take it more seriously. And uh, when I say more seriously, we need to show more responsibility. That's the way I uh, put uh, in a terms relatively uh, in a terms of uh, your own responsibility to making sure that it does not spread uh, in uh, in the people you are associated or the people around you and that, that's that's the simple message everybody's telling um, these days but what i'm trying to say here is that since this pandemic um, we have learned one thing that it might not uh, be easy uh, to survive here and we might need to do lots of uh, things or a combination of uh, things to survive. One of those combination of things to survive um, is uh, beside the showing the responsibility is to learn a new uh, trick and traits or uh, learn a new, uh, I would say, professions. Now, it's very hard uh, to learn a profession when you have passed certain ages there, but age should not be a barrier. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, people, including myself, that who, are, uh, who did, uh, like I did my research in, um, in late 40s, and that's quite normal in Europe uh, to do it. And I did my ma third master's in late 40s as well uh, a couple of years ago. So it's kind of, uh, you have to understand what's, uh, what is best for you, what suits you, and how you want to do it. Like uh, the vision is very important. So when I say about the vision, uh, the vision is that what you need to do it in order to survive this situation. This situation, uh, I'm not an expert uh, or, or I'm not a doctor here. But what I can see from the statistics, in, uh, especially in the United Kingdom and Ireland, it's not going to go away. This situation is, in fact, getting worse. So when this situation is going to get worse, and we need to adapt accordingly. What we need to do is that to learn new professions there. For example, like I said that in my uh, episode two with Rahat Kazmi uh, um, last week there, uh, I was mentioning that a lot of uh, people uh, ask this question, and not only from Ireland and UK, but uh, also from Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, especially the people who listen to me very uh, carefully or would listen to me every week there, my live stream there, that uh, what we need to do uh, to in order to survive there. And I tell them, um, and my answer is very simple and blunt, and that is you need to understand what is your uh, strength? You need to find out what is your strength. So when you know what is your strength, for example, if you know that you are good in numbers or you're good in mathematics or you are good in statistics there or you are good in accountancy, try to find out short-term courses and the courses which are available online. Try to get them. 
And uh, I know it's it's very difficult sometimes. You have a mindset there. It's not an easy job. Uh, I totally agree with uh, with the audiences there. But you have to uh, you have to make sure that your mind itself is uh, switched on to learn something new. There is n- it's never too late in your life to learn something new. For example, I haven't done. D- uh, drop shipping uh, in, um, in last uh, recent years there, but since the change of pandemic there, my focus was on drop shipping and especially the drop shipping of eBay and Amazon there. Now there are quite good number of people in India and Pakistan who are teaching Amazon drop shipping or FBA Amazon there. This is something you can learn very easily. You don't need to have a, a good qualification there. All you need to have a good common sense uh, to learn those old uh, tricks there. So um, when I say uh, you need to uh, know about your strengths. I'm sure everybody knows my strengths. For example, I'm not good in mathematics. I bluntly accept that. Mathematics uh, is not my uh, favorite subject there. I'm not weak in it, but it's not my favorite subject. But having said that, I still studied the artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning recently. I did learn Python as well. Although I, in by heart, I didn't like that, but in order to understand uh, the artificial intelligence, Python or a, a relatively a new um, language R is the more uh, important component of um, uh, learning the machine learning or artificial intelligence. So you need to uh, adapt. The message is that back on your strength and try to understand what is uh, your, your uh, uh, strength there and then um, uh, find out what is best for you. Now, I would always recommend that do your homework before uh, adapting a new line. Um, I, um, I had a recent uh, example of my house that for my daughter who wanted to do a corporate law. Now she's very much focused on doing a corporate law and she had in this mind for last six months while she was doing um, A-level or living cert that she is something uh, she likes very much. Um, she's good in argument. I'm just giving an example, a thought process there to corporate law. She did not got admission um, in uh, business and law because for corporate law, you need to have a, a good line, uh, rather business and law rather than a straightforward law or LLB. And she got admission in LLB and, and she said that, look that I can get into LLB and then um, um, I won't be, be able to pursue my dream, which is a corporate law. So I need to have law and business. And I asked her, why you want to do law and business? And she said, look, I have a better chance in case something goes wrong in later stages. So I would have law and I would have business. So I can either uh, take law or either I can take business or a combination of law and business is something like corporate law. So she's like, you know, the youngsters these days are very much focused and they know it uh, more or less, more of the students who are very much focused in studies to know where they would end up. Not in my case, when I was doing um, FSE way back in Pakistan, they had, I didn't knew it, whatever people guide them at that time. MBA was all over the world. Uh, everybody was talking about masters in business administration and people were talking about them. And everybody, um, all the friends said, let's do MBA. We did MBA. Let's do MPA, public administration. We did it. So this you need to be very much focused these days rather than um, thinking what other person are doing it you have to bank on your strength there rahat kazmi i think so is in the uh, in the studio uh, today we are going to uh, finish this three part episode of introduction to accountancy and i'm pretty sure um, um, you have loved uh, part 1 and part 2 in case you have missed part 1 and part 2 there will be posted the links there of youtube as well as the Facebook Live, which we did it uh, in two weeks. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can find on Mr. Rathab. Sorry about my phone. Rathab, you're there? Yeah, one second, yeah. I'm okay. here, yeah. All right. I can't see your screen. Uh, uh, baby, just a wall brick. One second, one second. We'll take a small uh, commercial break, and in the meantime, you can... Uh, if you would.
Shahid Bhai, you are back there. Um, how are you today? Oh, very good. Thank you, Tosif Bhai. Uh, I would say, you know, a friend of mine sent me a message early on. Mm -hmm. And he said, Rahat Ho was last seven, eight months. I told him, you know, thank God that I'm really grateful to God that we are alive in 2020. That's if, correct. If you save yourself from this pandemic, mm -hmm. you're very lucky, man. You save your family by being mm -hmm. responsible person. You're mm -hmm. very, very lucky, I think. So I think That's... it's better to save yourself, save your mm -hmm. family, don't do anything silly, don't do anything stupid, follow the government guidelines. Yes. That's the best thing to do. That's the best message, uh, I think so, as being a... Uh, um, a trainer or instructors or online people, we can give it to our audience. Be safe. And once you are safe, then you can protect your family, your loved one, your people around you. So that's a sort of a, a responsibility. We use a term corporate responsibility, but that's that's something bigger than that, you know. Well, anyone who has a job, I think, they, then they will also be playing a role in corporate responsibility because they will also be looking after their colleagues. That's you know, sometimes a person might think I'm very healthy. I have no, you know, anything serious, any other diseases. So I'll be, I'll be, I'll be okay. But then they don't think about any other, anybody else they meet in the family, mm -hmm. for example, little kids, elderly people in the house, some colleagues they work with, you know. And so social responsibility will be, our corporate responsibility. If they work somewhere, they need yeah. to look after other people as well who are working with them. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So are we ready to start the part three, the final episode of three part series? Yeah. Let's check, please, uh, if we, if our there you are. Let's make it a bit bigger, please. Let's make it a bit bigger. Uh, you would have yeah. to do it. How to do it? Okay, fine. Let's do it okay. then. <clears throat> that should be good size, I think. Yeah? Yes, that's correct. Then maybe we can recall it from first two and then we'll move on to today's, if that's okay with you. One second, one second. Okay, basically, uh, let me just go back. Okay. But first of all, I'd like to thank everyone who has taken part in the first two series and they've joined us today again. Uh, because the idea was to make sure that you all uh, understand the fundamentals of accounting, what accounting was all about. So most people, when they heard the word accounting, they get really nervous, you know, they get really afraid. Oh my God, what the hell is that? You know, it's rocket science. No, accounting is not rocket science. I did try and I'll try again this uh, third series as well to try my best to make sure that you all understand the concept. In an easy, in layman's or dummy language, you know, because you know, it's just that's the best way you can explain to them. <clears throat> so when, when we started the first series, we talked about what uh, uh, bookkeeping was and what accounting was. So then we talked about types of accounting. In types of accounting in series two, we talked about you know uh, financial accounting, managerial accounting, tax income tax accounting. So these were basically tax accounting. We talked about them. And then uh, my intention was to in episode three to talk about primary financial statements. Uh, then realize, you know, that if we talk, I mean, three there's three statements, the balance sheet, the income statement, and the uh, statement of cash flows. So to, see, to be honest, if I had spoken to three, three different of, you know, statements today in the, in the length of two people can understand, I'm sure we need about three hours. So correct, with yeah. permission, you know, I like to focus on one today. So it's better that people can understand. That's and we can do yeah. other plans, other programs for them, you know, later on to go through income statement and the statement of cash flow. Sure. Will that be okay? Uh, no, because I've gone back to work. So I think it's uh, maybe I think people who are expecting on us on, on, on Friday, I apologize to them. I think we can do probably sessions on Saturday or Sunday about the same time. So as long as the people are flexible, we are flexible. So uh, should we go on? Should we start? Cheers. Please go and okay. start. So guys, uh, let's talk about the balance sheet. Okay, the balance sheet, as the name says, balance sheet. Balance sheet has two sides, and both sides should always balance. If they're not balanced, that means you have done something wrong there, okay? So balance sheet considered the most awesome creation of the human mind. People will ask why? Because, you know, it's considered, because it has an accounting equation. It's considered equally good as, uh, you know, the energy formula which was uh, designed by Albert Einstein, the German physicist. He said e, e equals mc squared, mc squared, basically, you know, he said energy equals mass of the body times uh, speed of the life by twice, speed of life times two, uh, speed of life uh, squared. So this is as important as that. The quantity equation is as important as energy formula. So in, in balance sheet, the equation, uh, quantity equation is, is basically is assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. On left hand side of the equation, we have assets. Assets are what? Assets basically, we can see them, you know, in, we can touch them, we can feel them, they're tangible. 
But when it comes to other side of the question, where say liabilities and owners' equity, so we need to when we have liabilities, basically liabilities are what? Liabilities are what when we create assets, when we collect assets. Sometimes we, if we use our own money, that becomes owner's equity. If you use money from a loan or some, you know, some finance, that becomes a liability we have to pay back. We go through in, in details in assets. You know, assets basically, we, assets are quite few, few types. So every time we cannot buy all assets in one mode of payment. We cannot buy everything by ourselves. Sometimes we have to go to banks. Sometimes we have to go to some, uh, you know, investors, and they help us around. And then we basically record everything. Okay. Balance sheet has is not a new idea. Balance sheet has been going on for more than seven twenty years. But no, I think in modern balance sheet, we have to record everything. Everything we do, everything, any transaction we have, as per the as which which relates to balance sheet, we have to record it down. All right. I think all these people who use balance sheet was ancient Mesopotamians. These guys, they were farmers, for example, and the farmers they recorded everything with uh, you know like for, for example farmers they they wrote down the cows they bought. How many cows they had? How many sheep they had? Uh, how many sort of tools they had to sort of farm? So everything they did, they also recorded on how, where they bought it from. At that time, they used uh, clay tokens. You know, as we discussed in, in 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 part one, clay tokens were at that time they recorded with them different shapes of clay tokens. They recorded to uh, write down or maybe uh, keep account of what was they bought. And then later on, it went on to clay tablets. You know, and then of course these days we have tablets like Samsung tablet, Apple tablets, and so on and so. But that time. People also did something. They also had record of everything. So basically, uh, understanding access is no rocket science. Guys. It's simple as that. Okay. So if, if farmers as seven to seven thousand years ago could keep a record of that, I'm sure in the modern day day and age, you know, 2020 or 2021 uh, coming very soon, we can keep record of what we bought and how we bought it. Every time we buy an asset, we have to write it down. We have to make sure we record it. That you know. Where we got the money from to buy it? We need to make sure we record in the in balance sheet. We bought an asset. Or do we buy it? We well, need to write it down every time we buy something. We need to write down exactly the source of the of the asset, source of financing. Did we buy ourselves? If we bought ourselves, that becomes uh, an owner's equity. If we bought from a loan or finance from somebody, that becomes a liability because we then we had to pay them back. Okay, so guys, in the two sides of according to your question, the first side of the, of the on the left hand side is assets, which are the real world, the real world thing. We can touch them, we can feel them. You know, assets, for example, uh, to, to see where you're sitting there, the chair you have sitting on the chair, the desk in front of you, uh, you know, the mic maybe, the laptop, etc. Everything in your house, they're all your assets. Same as well, in, in where I'm sitting as well. I mean, anything you look at, you feel in your house, which you bought it. They're all your assets. So assets are as simple as that. Anything you bought, you use, now or for the future, they're all assets. Okay. So they are tangible, you know. But then second question is, and second part of the question is, where did we buy these assets from? Where did the money come from? Let me give you a simple example. I think some of you, or most of you, which, which are probably married, they have kids. Let's say you have a small kid, you know, a, a toddler, four to five years old. So let's say you come back from work and you knock on the door. Total opens the door and you know they start jumping and dancing in order to see you because they're so happy to see you. You climb them, you know, so hold them up, you know, on near your shoulders and you lift them up. And then you realize, you know, while you're holding it, they got 50 people note or 50 people in euro, 50 euro note in their hands. And of course, you'll be happy, you know, you see they, they're holding asset, but you will also be surprised and you might ask question, okay, son, a daughter, you know, where you got this money from? Where you got the 50 people note from? Because from four years old, five years old, you won't expect to hold them 50 people note in the hand all of a sudden. You need to ask them where did the money come, money come from. So similarly, balance sheet is just as that. You know, we need to explain. We bought an asset. Where did it come from? So we need to if if we if we bought ourselves, that becomes our owner's equity. And if we have basically purchased it through a loan or finance or credit, that becomes our liability. Now let's go through in detail about definition of assets, what assets are, and we'll also go through some examples of assets. Definition is resources in a business either controlled or owned by the business, which will provide future benefit. Okay. Sometimes we don't own, a, own an asset. We lease, for example, you know, some businesses will have maybe company vans, company cars, and they don't want to buy it. They just want to lease it. 
So by leaving as well, because you for the time period you agreed to lease that that, that asset or that product, that is your property. Because you are responsible for it. You had to pay them the value for it. If you, if you lose it, you had to pay the full value. You lost it, you bought it. That's how it works. So until that time period, lease, prop lease property is also owned by you. That's also considered as your asset. Of course, the difference is if you bought something, let's say even on finance, and after the, the period of finance is gone, then becomes your property. But lease property, lease items, lease car, lease van will have to go back to the lease provider. Okay, it will now become your property, but during the uh, the time of the lease, it'll stay as your property, it'll stay in your asset side of the balance sheet. Okay, let's go through some examples of assets. First of all, I'm sure all of you all of you are aware of Apple. I'm sure most of you have Apple iPhones, you know. Maybe sometime you might have Apple MacBook Pros or Apple iPads and, you know, Apple Watches and so and so It's a big company. So Apple balance sheet shows that they got lots of cash, guys. Not only small cash, in billions of dollars. And when we say in our business world, cash is a king, that means Apple has a, has a king. That means when they have a king on their side, they can grow easily in future. They can go a long way. They can have new sort of, you know, uh, what you call it, new experiments and new products. You know, they can bring new additions to the current products they have in the market. Or they can do more innovation in the future. That's what basically means, you know, cash is the king. Next example is from American Express. Well, hey, let's, let's talk about something else, something, another part of asset, another type of asset is accounts receivable. If some of you don't know what accounts receivable means, basically, you know, let's say we, ha we buy things, we sell things, okay? So when you buy things, you know, that becomes accounts payable. If we don't pay them, if you don't pay them uh, cash straight away, we borrow from them, and then let's say we have a contract with them to pay them back in 30 days, or uh, 60 days, or maybe even 15 days, sometimes it's even seven days. So seven days, 21 days, 28 days, a month, two months. That's really the term, you know, of, of credit. If you're a bigger supplier, you will have, you will easily get a credit from anyone. People give you credit. That means you'll, you'll buy all the, all the products, or most of the products on credit. Uh, but as soon as they come to, the, come, come to the company, you have to record them as assets. At the same time, you have to also record them in your liability as well, because then you have to pay them back. But when you sell, you're, you make a sale, you sell something to your to your customers, and let's say you had the same agreement with them that they don't have to pay you cash straight away. You have to, uh, basically, you had to, uh, you know, collect the money from the later on. You send invoice to them, they pay you later on. And when they owe you money, that goes in your balance sheet as accounts receivable because people owe you money. Accounts receivable is basically, you know, it's, it's asset, it's current asset. People will pay you others in seven days, 21 days, 28 days, or six, 30 days, or 60 days, depending on your uh, basically uh, agreement with them. Okay, so let's talk about uh, American Express and other card companies. Accounts receivable is the biggest asset of the companies like American Express, MasterCard, and Visa. The clients sign the contract. They, we sign the contract with the credit card company, and we're going to use their money, and then we're going to pay them back. But how it works? What's in it for uh, you know, American Express and other card companies? They charge us a big, a big amount of interest. Typically, 29 point something to 35, 40% even APR, or, you know, interest rate. That's very expensive. Okay, but the profit they make, the profit, they make huge profit from us, guys. A lot of profit. When we have, when we go through the, the credit card spending, people don't realize how much, you know, <clears throat> how much the, the trouble they are. Obviously, when people have got credit cards, more than one credit card, they're definitely in trouble. They don't realize it, but they are in trouble. You know, uh, I'm, I'm just saying because, you know, we all make mistakes to, to see I made mistakes as well. There was a time, you know, I had a American Express gold card, gold American Express card. And then, you know, at that time you feel like a king. You know, I got money, I got money, but that is not really your money. You keep spending money, then you have to pay it back. And sometimes, you know, if you don't use your job, then you are, you're stuck there. And you have to go through all the different, you know, procedures of paying the debt back. And you go into lots of financial difficulties. So these companies they will sort of load you into it, you know. They will, might give you initially, let's say, 500 euros, 500 pound of credit. You pay them back straight away. Then they give you 1,000 pound or 2,000 pound, goes up to 5,000, 10,000. It goes up. You become a good customer, but then you get more credit cards and, you know, you can't pay them back, for example, then you're in trouble. Uh, let's take an example of Citibank. Citibank has over a trillion dollars worth of accounts receivable. Can you imagine? A lot of people owe them money, okay? Trillion dollars. Uh, I don't think Pakistan has even that kind of budget in the year. Uh, 
or even smaller countries like Bangladesh or, or Nepal, etc. So a trillion dollar, one company, American Express, you know. So see, a long time ago, in, back in 1995, my dad came to visit me in UK. It's the only time he came, and then uh, he passed away in 2009. When he came, I took him to Oxford Street, and we looked at some, you know, big stores like John Lewis. We saw, we looked at, you know, uh, Selfridges. And he says to me, if you, have, if you own a store like this, you don't need to be prime minister of a country like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. You're well off. You're, you're better off without, you know, mm -hmm. being prime minister or in, even in politics. So these companies are huge. The corporations are huge, you know. That's great. Okay, just let's take next example of if they could survive. If they could survive, yes. Of course, you know, over the time, they learned the tricks, you know, they, of course, you know. Uh, <laughs> John Lewis is another example of, but here we talk about different kind of assets here. We talk about inventory and buildings. Because, because you know, we talk about a receivable, we talk about cash, Apple has cash. We talk about receivables, when people owe you money, they bought goods and services from you. But then we let's talk about inventory and buildings. If people who are not aware of John Lewis, John Lewis is a luxurious department store uh, in UK. Uh, it's very set up, you know, famous for middle class, upper middle class, rich class. You know, they all go to John Lewis do shopping. John Lewis, you know, they have admissions trade now, never knowingly undersold. Very good company. I wouldn't hesitate to buy from them because their products are very good. They all their customer service is excellent, and they will now, as they say, mission statement. They always will be very fair with you. The prices are expensive, yes, of course, but you know, they uh, are a company which you can rely on. So let's say you, we drive uh, to a John Lewis store, or you, it could be any other store. It could be any other store from you know any anywhere you are, a bigger store. Let's say you drive to the store. First of all, you park your car, or let's say you're walking. You just get, enter the car park. The moment you enter the car park, that that's where the asset starts. The car park is owned by them. Car park is their asset. When you look at the big building in front of you, that big building is their asset. You know, building block, etc. They're all their assets. When you walk through the doors inside, you look at all the shelves, all the shelves full of clothes, full of you know home home furnishing products, everything else, counters, tables, chairs, etc. Where you see you know everything which is sold there, in the store, fixed and fitting, equipment where sort of they keep things uh, you know uh, on hold, everything there, they're all their assets. So from car park to the building to inside, you know everything else is is basically they're all their their assets. So the inventory, the stock we have there. To sell, building everything is assets. So basically, you know, these days, a uh, company like uh, John Lewis would have very intelligent systems. So every time this something is sold, it informs the warehouse in the back. You know, these things have been sold. So they are the where They get lists of things which have been sold every single day. So they'll never, you know, keep the shelves empty there. There's all plus, you know, there was a time to see if when we had, you know, people were thinking, if you buy in bulk, you save money. The people used to buy in bulk and stock it up, stock it up in, in the storerooms, and then say, we bought it a lot cheaper. But then they, at that time, they used to forget the cost of storing that product. You know, they, they might need to hire or buy a warehouse, electricity and gas are warehouse, you know. Then people who will control the warehouse, their wages, delivery costs, everything else, from delivery from warehouse to, to the actual uh, shop outlet, etc. They forgot all the costs. So these days, people don't believe in the storage anymore. You know, you, you have... Lots of companies, they will have real-time suppliers. You need something, you go online, you send, send them an email, or you make a call, or sometimes you can even get you know, some system like you know, uh, purchasing systems or procurement systems. Uh, one of the good systems I know in the UK is called Procure Visit. You, you have a system installed in your, on your desktop. Your, your customer, your supplier will also have a system installed in your, on the desktop as well. It made an image copy of that. Mm -hmm. Whatever you need, you list, make a list, Send them through system all the lists they need. They got you know in, information in real time, and they will acknowledge. And you got acknowledgement receipt that they they got it. You it, they give you time. One time will come. The delivery driver will come and they will deliver everything uh, with the person. And they have little you know little tablet in their hand. They'll mark what was they got. If you don't have everything, you take you don't take on you cross that one that we didn't get that. So supply will know that they they short deliver some item, and then the other will send you. A refund for that, a rebate for that, and maybe you know they'll send the replacement in a few days time. Uh, I just want to uh, give you an example for today. Sure. Um, for UK, one of my client, I, I booked up uh, from Amazon, and within five minutes, I got uh, an email from Amazon that it's going to deliver on Sunday, not even Monday, 
Sunday if you have a Prime uh, a subscription with Amazon. So that's the height of a good customer services, uh, taking care of your customers, you know, a good example. It's because, so see if, you know, if you have a, a drone, for example, a drone doesn't mind working on Sunday as well, you know. So they might, they might be delivering by drone. No, even, might, not, might be... even, even not they have been delivering by drone, but the, their network system is so optimized that you uh, that you place an order in on a Saturday afternoon and you get an email within 10 minutes that is going to deliver it on Sunday, where most of 90% of our people all around the world are of the state of the mind that Sunday is ho holiday sort of a, a, a thing that and nothing happens other than family there. But here you are, it's going to be delivered on Sunday. You're right. That's great. Definitely. Very impressive. There, there, I think their service is very good. I, I've been buying from eBay and Amazon, I think, but I think eBay is, is not the same anymore as it used to be uh, five, ten years ago. But I think Amazon, their customer service really is outstanding, definitely. That's correct. That's correct, yeah. Okay, another example uh, we have is British Airways, an airline company. How do we define their assets? Aeroplanes. You know, when you go to airport, you see a big aeroplane, aeroplanes. Okay, you know, to see if there was a company in, 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 in Ireland. I once went for a job interview that uh, mm -hmm. I was we hired. At the time, as a balance sheet accountant. Mm -hmm. So, I think company was called, I think, I uh, forgot the name of the company. They were an American company based in, in Dublin. And in the website, it said they had more than uh, 12 billion of assets in 12 billion euros assets in Dublin, in, in Ireland. So, on the website, it said 54 aeroplanes, passenger planes in mm -hmm. Dublin. So, when I met with the person who was interviewed, he said, Oh, Rahat, we got 45 aeroplanes. 45 aeroplanes? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Because your website says 54 aeroplanes. Can you imagine if one aeroplane costs 200 million pounds? Mm -hmm. So there's a big discrepancy there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 54 to 45. That's correct, yeah. Nine, nine aeroplanes are missing. And this really? Mm -hmm. He checks straight away on the website. He says, oh, yes, you're right. We'll get a change straight away. That's really misleading to our mm -hmm. our our stakeholders. Anybody mm -hmm. who wants to invest in a company, they might think, okay, they yeah, like work. No, no, no. But... They were, uh, the stakeholder doesn't like, uh, they want a transparency in balance sheet, you know, at least. Of course. So basically, aeroplanes like British Airways, Emirates, Virgin, all the plane, all the planes are their resources. Resources because they have to use these resources to transport their customers. I mean, who are the airline customers? Customers, passengers, you know, who travel from A to B, A to B, their destinations. People buy tickets uh, from the airlines and then they travel their airlines so, through the through the aeroplanes. So aeroplanes are the resources. Like you know, if you go to a restaurant, the kitchen in the back, the big you know plants in the kitchen, the big cookers, they're all resources. To provide service, provide product service, yeah. So these resources are the assets which will provide future monetary benefits because you know, uh, if people if, if they have aeroplanes, people will travel in them. You know, if if they have jumbo aeroplanes, etc., whatever they have, they will have different resources, different uses of them. Customers will, will use services of travel by purchasing the flight tickets. Yeah, that's basically example of uh, assets which are owned by British Airways or other airlines. Okay, next one in balance sheet uh, comes liabilities. Let's first of all talk about what liabilities are, definition of liabilities. Obligations which may require sacrifice of future economic benefit uh, in the form of transferring assets or providing services. When we say economic benefits, economic benefit, if let's say, uh, we, we we're just talking about, you know, basically British Airways. If British Airways is taking passengers from one place to other place, they are they are basically sacrificing their their petrol costs. They're they're sacrificing the wages of the people who manage the plane, the ground staff, you know, the people who will come and clean the plane, catering services. So they're all sacrifices, and sacrifices because people will pay them in return. So when when we have liabilities, liabilities could be you know that we could have two kind of services from people. One is product, one is service. Product is basically when you sell something. In physical nature, and services when somebody has given you some time. For example, you know, if uh, I work somewhere as a, as a corporate trainer or a lecturer, my time my time is is my service. My service basically is given in time. As we say, time is value, time is money. My money is my time. So basically, in that way, you know, guys, services are like that. Yeah. So services provide. We provide services. We, we provide products. The sacrifice of time, sacrifices of products we had, we given them away. Yeah, that's how liabilities create, you know. Okay, uh, let's talk about accounts payable, which is one of the biggest, you know, element of liabilities in balance sheet. 
And let's say, let's say we also go through John Lee's example, which we talked a few minutes ago. Payable word as a word shows payable. That means it has to be paid back in the future. We can't keep it up. We have to pay it back. Now, let's take John Lewis' example. John Lewis is such a big company. They have stores all over UK, and they got stores in other uh, European parts as well. But, you know, John Lewis, you know, when they buy things from suppliers, they don't gather them all on the door and in wing say, okay, guys, let's, let's, let's pay you all cash. How much are you? Here's cash. Come and take the cash. They don't do that. So they will basically, and people, you know, to be honest, John Lewis is such a company, such a big company, their suppliers will not say no to them even to give them credit. People will be happy to provide them credit and give them, you know, things on credit so they can pay them later on. Even if they don't pay them on time, I'm sure suppliers will still be very quiet. They'll be still very grateful that they got their business because it's such a big company. Yeah. That's such an advantage of being such a big brand. So John Lewis does not need to pay all suppliers by cash, but they can when they purchase their inventories, but they promise to pay them in future. You know, as we discussed before, it could be seven days, it could be 14 days, 21 days, 30 days, 28 days, or six, six, 60 days even, you know, depending on the supplier, the supplier or type of supplier they have, depending on the amount of money they borrowed from someone. So this, this is basically, you know, the amount, the promise they make to them, obligation, yeah, this, this is obligation, promise, they say, hey, they will pay you in seven days, 14 days, this is obligation. Obligation basically is like also a liability. Okay, John Lewis will have to record the purchases. If they buy it from so many suppliers, they can't write it down on back of tissue. They have to write it down. They must have some good bookkeeping system or accounting system where they can record all the purchases, how much money they owe from each person. Okay. So when they buy in credit, we need to record them onto asset side because, of course, they're assets. They're selling them. Of course, when they buy some item, they will sell into uh, sell the item as, as profit. So profit will you know, profit will go on one side, the cost of that item. Which, which the buying price will go into liabilities because they need to pay it back. Okay, so this is how we record a constable is basically when company will buy some asset from somebody on credit. The the uh, you know the actual actual item itself is registered there, and when it sells, it sells it as an asset. You know, asset value will be in profit. The cost the difference between the the selling price and the buying price that will be profit, and the actual buying price will also be reg, uh, recorded into liability side. Uh, so if is anyone asking questions or in live audience or thing please you know if you see anything please let me know that I can go through as as we go along okay guys let's talk let's talk about another type of liability another type of liability will be wages payable when it comes to wages guys you know just like uh, uh, john lewis british airways will not gather all their ground stuff all their you know sort of uh, air stuff you know come guys let's let's pay you all how much were you every day how many hours did you work it won't happen like that. Actually, I don't know any company who does it, apart from maybe a local carnage shop might do it, but I think all the bigger corporations, you know, bigger companies, they will have a set system of payment, or pay, payroll will be other monthly, mostly monthly, because it's easy, it's convenient. Uh, but some service companies might do a weekly payroll because they say they have lots of turnover, they might have some lots of casual stuff, and they like to pay people, you know, if they can't hold, uh, they can't wait for the money for two weeks, they might pay them every week, but every week is a headache. If you pay people every week, you have to go through the same process of, you know, going through, uh, paying everyone the wages, working through, all, uh, you know, their hourly, uh, hourly contract every, every, every week, and then record them, send a, uh, send a file to bank to pay them all, then print their wage slips and P45s, and living certs and all that. So it takes a long time. So I think most companies will do either bi-weekly, which is two weeks, or monthly. Okay. So British Airways will not call everyone to pay them cash in hand. I'm sure they need to have a good system. So guys, wages are always paid in areas, okay? They're not paid on time. They're not paid you know, on, on daily basis. So they're paid in areas. Let's say a person goes to work for 30 days to see if, and in 30 days, or 31 days of the month, every day the person goes to work and comes back from work, he has earned income for that day, but not been paid yet. They'll get paid after 31 days. End of the month, they get paid for it. So they earn the income, but not get paid. So because they earn the income, that becomes liability for the airline to pay them back. So that goes into every, so that's why we call it wages payable. Every time, you know, the, people work the whole stuff, it could be admin people, could be even a rank and file, could be uh, team leaders, supervisors, managers, line managers, head of departments, C-level people, everybody who works for the company, the wages, wages which have not been paid, they become a liability, are wages payable by the company to, uh, to supply. So I think, 
British Airways is just an example. You can have any company you work for, you have worked before, you can think about that as an example. Every time you didn't get paid till the end of the month, your wages to them were your their, your liability to them. They had they owe you money for that. I I think so. This uh, weekly payment system or a fortnightly payment system is much more common in uh, UK, Ireland, and probably some of the countries of a uh, European Union. But uh, in Middle East and in Pakistan and India, as a matter of fact, in Bangladesh and all majority of Asian countries, it's monthly rather than weekly or fortnightly. To be honest, I I prefer monthly because monthly is like easier for the for the company. You you know you link payroll in. Uh, it can really sort of make your life easier. You know, when I worked in, you remember when, you, when we, I used to do some get-togethers in uh, Carlton Airport Hotel? That's right, yeah, yeah. I worked for them. At that time, they had seven hotels uh, in, in the country. And in seven hotels, we had one person who was doing payroll. And that one, I mean, each hotel had three people there, okay? One was uh, accountant, that's the French controller. Second person was assistant accountant. And third person was a clerical admin. So I, so I was their group auditor, so I basically go around to different properties and help them, support them in, in many ways I could. So the person who was doing payroll, they would take two days, complete two days. Every hotel had probably 100, I think, staff on average. So to pay 100 people, they will take two days. They will close the door, do not disturb, sign on. The people can mm -hmm. talk to them because they're doing payroll. And it was such a nightmare. They will not help in anything else. Doing pay mm -hmm. I'm doing payroll every week. Mm -hmm. So That's I spoke correct. to my uh, director of finance. I look, you know, he was old school Irish man. So look, come on, guys, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm. We don't need to uh, take 14, 14 man days to pay people payroll. We can do that, you know, in half a day. Mm. He says, well, get lost. I said, what do you mean get lost? I can show you. I can I can prove to you. Mm. Maybe just because you haven't seen it, you haven't heard of it, that doesn't mean it doesn't, it doesn't exist. Mm. I mean, modern America can show you where, where it comes from. Mm. So I can call a company who could do payroll for them. For, at that time, they uh, there was a company called Quantum Payroll. Mm -hmm. Quantum Payroll guys were, I think they were ex-Sage uh, Payroll. Yeah, so they, they I, yeah. made, made company called Quantum, and they at that time, you know, back in let's say you know 2009 and 10, eight, not 2007 or seven, eight, I think. At that time, they made a system which was very much Excel based. You can you could do payroll, you could export, you know, a time sheet from Excel into X, you know, from payroll to Excel, mm. fill all the number of hours in. It had name and everything, you know, the rate of rate of pay. You just fill the hours in and import back in. And when you import back in, save it, payroll done. Mm, so definitely. I did the first payroll in the head mm. office. I think it took me about six hours mm. for, for seven hotels, let's say 700 people or stuff. Mm. And then we hired somebody, we trained this lady. She first time she did was, I think, 2.30 or 3 in the afternoon. Mm. And then she put everything by 12 o'clock lunchtime. Mm. You know, everything was done. Mm. Our payroll. Can you imagine we did all the work in half a day mm. instead of 14 man days, you know, which used to take before. I know, yes, the SAGE is quite popular in Ireland. I'm not sure about UK, but uh, definitely they are the number one payroll uh, processing software. In Which the, one? Uh, uh, SAGE, SAGE. Oh, yes, yes. SAGE, as, you know, SAGE, the reason SAGE didn't didn't prosper that time because SAGE was not very flexible at the time when I was there. Yeah. But no, I'm sure other people who left SAGE, <laughs> they made their own companies. Mm. They must have woken SAGE up as well. Come on, guys, do something. Be more creative. Be sort of more, you know, sort of yeah. open with changes. Yeah, no, they are very quite popular in Ireland. I'm not sure about the United Kingdom regarding the uh, payroll processing for Ireland. Definitely, if I say they are very popular. You know. well, Sage, Sage also is very popular in UK for small and medium enterprises. They're, they all use them. For bookkeeping. Uh, yeah. For bookkeeping, yes. A Sage yeah. payroll is part of bookkeeping. You know, it's, it's sometimes it's built in. Some people mm -hmm. buy Sage payroll separately as well. That's correct, yeah. Okay. And another example of liabilities is, uh, let's say, taxes payable. Okay, I'm taking the example here of British Petroleum at BP. BP, as you know, this British company. Uh, you can take example of any other company we should know of. Or you, you worked in it, maybe you heard of them. Their taxes are liabilities. So if you don't keep paying taxes, they, they keep ending up, and then they become quite, quite complex. It's better for a petroleum company to keep paying the taxes as they go along, because taxes are basically a liability which sits on balance sheet uh, of, of the company. So BP will have much more complex, a bigger taxing uh, accounting system uh, to deal with tax because they will have various taxes. They've got a tax in the form of property tax, sales tax, import tax, export tax, you know, all these taxes from different countries, different taxation laws. For example, if they're working in the UK, there are different tax, uh, corporation tax rate. If they work in Netherlands, they will have different corporation tax. If they're working in Ireland, they'll be, they'll have 
no hunky dory easy peasy you know 12 half percent tax is <laughs> a lot easier is working middle east they will have different taxes to pay in north america south america of course so all these complications they had to deal with them as one company so there are different systems they'll have tax teams you know tax teams working for them uh, and tax team will be specialists in dealing with tax matters so like wages of course british, british, british petroleum at bp will not pay tax to tax men you know cash in hand they have to sort of register everything uh, in their balance sheet and pay them through tax returns tax returns you know whenever the, it's depending on which uh, which country has when tax return is due but in uk and ireland i think it's, it's every two months you have to you know, submit your tax returns but in when it comes to corporation taxes you have to pay you, the government will give you extra 10 months after your year is finished because they'll give you time to sort of balance your year and etc and make sure you get no less you recover all your money because tax as we discussed in part two of this uh, course uh government doesn't expect you to pay taxes as you earn revenue like you know the people who are working in the job when they come home from work they have earned revenue they have earned income but they don't get paid until end of the month so similarly as 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 a business you might earn revenue but you know you don't get paid for it until you get paid for it government will not ask you to pay the pay taxes okay another example of liabilities is uh, long term debt now this one i'm going to to see i'm going to talk about really very very weird example okay uh, most of us know when it comes to long term liability long term liability basically is you know when we say short term liability short term liability could be you know banks overdraft could be you know maybe uh, somebody we need to pay them back in uh, within a month's time up to a year let's say let's say up to a year but when it comes to long term liability long term liabilities they start from 2 years to 5 years time 10 years time if we if it's you no know, equity loan etc it could even be 15 to 25 years time but here we know that some companies like you know coca cola and uh, walt disney they issue bonds for 100 years 100 100 years they take a loan from companies for 100 years can you imagine you know 100 years loan you know we don't even live that long <laughs> depending on you know where you live your average life span you know could be 60 years 65 years but those companies don't think like that they might think you know our company set up 1857 1840 something it was owned by their great grandfather was passed on to grandfather then passed on to their dad you know they they they're running it but then they they want to leave this to great grandkids even you know so for them they like to look at the benefit of the company benefit of the other corporation instead of you know okay looking at the short term short term side they don't have short term oversight they're looking at they're thinking outside the box how the company will benefit of course 100 years is a long time that means when we have loan for 100 years it would be quite expensive but then what the hell we have to pay that in 100 years time so it's, it's not a big deal you know 100 years time so similarly uh, what what can say is you know if we take mortgage in the house mortgage really is you know depending on your age etc 15 to 25 is 30 years time so let's say to so see we bought a home on mortgage uh, let's say 300000 euros we had cash in hand we paid 50000 euros as deposit or down payment so 250000 euros over 25 years time roughly speaking will be will end up paying more than 500000 or 600000 euros back to them 25 years time mortgage i'm sure 100 year loan 100 year mortgage will be lot of, lot more expensive but you sure to pay them back uh, because you know for example walt disney you know they had uh, agreement this is this agreement 100 years bond started in 1993 so this will be sure in 2093 basically but if they were able to pay in 30 years time which is 2023 they can still pay it off that means if they pay in 30 years time they'll be paying a lot less interest their their cost of capital the cost of loan will be a lot cheaper if they had paid in 100 years time but they had option there option is they can pay back in in 100 years time if they want to they can pay pay back in next century easily it's not example is not only about corporation but also you know some countries like argentina australia austria mexico they also issued 100 years bonds yeah so basically you know this this is not very common but you know it, it happens it does happen in cor corporate world so i think in my opinion it was better for you to know uh, everybody everyone knows that they are when you talk about long-term liabilities long-term liabilities really are considered five to 25 years but guys no hold on 100 years liabilities also exist in this world Okay, next type of liability is basically un, unearned revenue. Let's take example of British Airways again. 
Okay, I'm going to ask a very weird question. So, see if either yourself or anyone you know, have you ever traveled by an airline? You know, of course, you have Virginal, uh, you have maybe Ryanair, very famous airline in, in, in Ireland. No, I've, I've flown from British Airways at Virgin. Okay. Airways. No, I mean, I'm, okay, I'm sure you have, but what I'm saying is very famous airlines in, in Ireland are other Air Lingus and, and Ryanair. Are any other, Ryanair, yeah. Ryanair. Air Lingus are any Ryanair. other airline you can think of? Have you ever traveled by an airline? You, you book airline, you made a booking, you didn't pay for the pay for the booking, you travel, you came back, then you paid them at the airport when you were leaving, you pay, okay, hey guys, I travel, I just came back, here's the money, cash or credit card. No, it's all at once. It's all at once. Mm -hmm. So no airline will accept that, no airline will, will let correct, you pay yeah. afterwards. They always mm -hmm. ask money in advance. That's Sometimes correct. they pay money even in a year in advance. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, you know, I was, when I moved to Dublin from, from Amsterdam, as you remember, uh, at that time, I, for a year, my, when my wife was living in Dublin, I, uh, Ireland, uh, you know, in, in Amsterdam, I used to go back every every weekend. Mm. I used to come back Monday morning from Amsterdam to Dublin and go back on on, uh, on Friday evenings. Mm. So for the whole year, you know, I took I think forty eight flights at least. Mm -hmm. So I knew all the Air Lingus pilots, you know, when they landed, you know, what what kind of landing they had. Each pilot I knew the names. Okay, yes. this pilot today we got you know Seamus. Okay, Seamus. Oh, terrible parking, terrible mm -hmm. landing. Mm -hmm. Okay, somebody else, you know, maybe we've got some, you know, uh, Lionel. Lionel is here. Okay, Mike, Lionel, he will have, you know, very good takeoff. So mm -hmm. I knew all the pilots through the landing and their takeoff. Uh, so, yeah. so basically, I used to book flights in advance, mm -hmm. four to five weeks in advance to get the right value. Otherwise, you know, if you had booked the flight the day before. Yeah, you get to... a good value if you book in advance. Yeah. yeah. So basically, what, what happens, you know, your advance payment for a service which you have not received yet, it becomes obligation or liability to the balance sheet. So if we, mm -hmm. we book a flight, let's say we book a flight for uh, three months in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about Aer Lingus or Ryanair. We booked a flight to Ryanair or Aer Lingus. We paid for it. In the balance sheet, our money sits as liability. liability. So they mm -hmm. owe us money. Mm -hmm. They need to, of course, if they don't provide the service which they promise, they have to give us the money back. Mm -hmm. So to sort of, Digested money or ether money, they had to provide us that flight which, which they promise. They need to take us from destination A to B where we need to go, where we intend to go. Mm. Yeah? So this, this is basically very normal. You know, they had to do that. They, this is they had to take us to desired locations. Okay, next I mean, let, let me talk about one example here of airlines. United Airlines, they have collected 3.4 billion dollars from people which they have not provided flights yet. Mm. I recently had a weird experience with uh, with United Airlines, not personally myself, but my wife. Mm -hmm. She was supposed to go to uh, California through New York from, mm -hmm. from London. So they booked a flight, I think, herself and aunt, uh, I think, with United Airlines back in February and March. At that time, they were told, no, no, America is locked down, so you can't come to America. So her flight was canceled, mm -hmm. but they got the credit note. Mm -hmm. No refund, mm -hmm. credit note. I was going to say the same thing, but you just snatched words out of my mouth. There, it happened to my wife as well. She booked for Pakistan, and um, twice she booked it, and uh -huh. they are all keep on saying you have can have a credit dot, but no refunds there. See, this is a gimmick, you know. They want to keep the money because at the moment they're not very busy, mm. and they want to keep because when they keep the money from you, probably they, they are control. operating. Uh, they are operating on lost as at the moment. Maybe. Most of them are, but see, if they give you money refund straight away, that, that means their cash flow is in trouble. Trouble. Yeah. So they don't mind keeping your bad bad cash flow, but they they like to keep themselves. That's correct. Yeah. So basically, my wife, you know, she had flight to cancel in February, March, mm -hmm. and she booked again uh, about a week ago. So basically, when she went flight to book, so she's very happy. She basically spent all time, you know, unpacking her bags and everything. You know, she also uh, did the ESET, you know, visa online from American uh, from American immigration. Asta. 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 Asta sorry, Asta was yeah, all done. Asta. Mm -hmm. uh, it all came back okay, you know. Of course, you know, if people don't know what ASTA means, ASTA basically, you know, it's not like same as India, Pakistan, where you have to go to embassy and send passport through uh, maybe. It's, uh, a, uh, it's, a, very, it's called very a pre, pre screening uh, of the EU national peoples there who are based in EU. They don't need to get a visa, but they need to do a pre screening. So that's called ASTA, EST. You fill a form online basically, right? That's right, yeah. For mm -hmm. everything, purpose of visit, and then they approve it. So, you know, amazingly, her extra came back approved as well. Visa was approved. Airline gave, gave the ticket. So, we said everything is fine. I woke up very early in the morning, took her to the airport. I said, okay, I'll wait in the parking. You go in there, please, and let me know. He called back, no, no, please don't go anywhere. I'm in trouble. What? 
she went to the airline counter and said, no, please, madam, see the airline uh, immigration officer first. Immigration officer said to her, madam, you're going to America? Yes. Why? I mean, why? I'm going to see my family there. Mm. But you can't go. We're in lockdown. She said, in lockdown, you are locked in, in March. We're still in lockdown. But, you know, why do you inform me? Mm. I mean, why do you inform me? Come on. She said, I applied for ESTA visa. Mm. If there's a visa, you could have said to me, no, you can't go. You could have refused my visa. Then mm. I know that there's some, something wrong. Yeah. I spent all evening yesterday, you know, packing my bags, came here, and then airline she airline when I booked on airline uh, spec airline website, mm. no window popped up. No, I'm sorry, madam, you can't go. Only these people can go. Mm. You know, I had to go to Canada to, uh, you know, my my mom died last year in November, so we had this my mom's first death in mm. So I had to go there as well in November. Yeah. I realized when I went to their site, I realized you know, you can only go either your son of someone, daughter of someone, wife of someone, spouse. That's uh, it's only. If you are blood related there. Uh, I mean, I saw our sibling, better little bit. My my family lives a sibling lives there, but I I could not go because you know. I know, yeah, it, no, they, they they make it a, 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 as vague as possible because they want to take your money there. And then having said that, they also say that it's your responsibility to check with the airline or the website from time to time. You know, they put everything burden on your shoulders. There. You know, when you call airline, they say everything is on the website. So when website doesn't show everything, so basically. That's correct. Yeah, it's uh, hidden. Uh, Hidden information. Yeah, but, you know, being I don't think this is you know social good corporate social responsibility from. Yeah, I, know, I understand that, but they are all in trouble. You know, um, more or less because uh, it's not of uh, themselves, but uh, because of this pandemic situation. So they're just trying to, uh, you know, survive in the difficult times. That's what and they're trying everybody to. Everybody in trouble to see if no even people in trouble. Uh, I know, understand. I understand that. Yeah. It's fair on people as well to put all the burden on the people. That's crazy. Give yeah. money back. I said, I will give you refund. I will give you credit. Not travel again with us. You can't get money back. That's so crazy. That's yeah. it. Funny enough, it, like I was telling, it happened with my wife. She bought one time with Etihad credit note. And she said, that, okay, let me try another airline. So she tried with the Turkish and in the same case, another credit note. So, that, you know, the, it's the same story. I said, why you want to try another thing there with another line? She said, that might be, I would be able to uh, travel there. And I'm sure she could be travel now, but she doesn't, can't travel now because she has her own work our obligations at the moment, you know. Of course, of course. So can you imagine United Airlines, they have $3.4 billion money collected from people which they have not provided. Flies mm -hmm. yet. Flies so yet. Yeah. I imagine this it's a big money, it's a big chunk of money. It's a, it's a good amount of money. <laughs> so, guys, this was unearned revenue. Examples were for unearned revenue. That means until they provide flights, this money will not become their assets. This is still a liability. Okay, until they provide flights, this money will not transfer to their asset, it will not become their cash. Although they got cash in the hand, but this money will not show in the balance sheet on the cash side and asset side until they have provided a flight. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Okay, next thing in balance sheet is uh, owner's equity. Okay, we talked briefly before, but uh, let's, so, let's go into detail. First of all, let's define what owner's equity is. The amount the owners originally invested in the business and the profit they have left in the business, uh, which is also known as retained earnings, ownership interest in the company's assets. That's all owner's equity. Basically, let's say we have two uh, owners of a business, People who invest the money in the business initially, so this this will become the percentage of ownership in the business, a percentage of interest in the business. If they all are equal partnership, 25% each, that, that means they will have 25% interest equally, all partners. If one person only has 30%, other people have, let's say, uh, three partners, 20, 35 each, of course, then will be interest will be 35% for one and, well, 30% for one and 35% for two other. So basically, generally, generally speaking, the two ways we can buy assets for business. You know, we can either borrow the money from somebody. We can borrow money from a bank. We can take a loan. We can take, um, you know, maybe equity loan. Investors can invest money in your, in your business. That becomes a liability because we need to pay them back. If we spend our own money, owner's own money, that's considered owner's equity. Okay, owners owners might you know uh, might have some saving, for example. They might have made money from another another business. Or they might be working somewhere and saving money and invest money in the business. So all you know, their their money basically sits in asset side. When you know, owner's equity is 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 basically you know, it's money which which company owes back to the company, back to the back to the owner until it's paid back. It'll, it'll be sitting as you know, liability to it's this kind of liability basically to be paid back to owner until owner takes money back. Business can make its own money and then. But I think balance will never change. Balance will always some some sort of owner's equity because original capital is, is always there. 
sometimes you, you make some drawing, but then more time you invest money back again. And also a lot of governments in Europe, they have this, this kind of scheme. If you reinvest in business again, in growth of business, you get some tax deductions. You don't pay all the taxes, you know? That's why most businesses, they open new branches, because then they save taxes like this. Okay, uh, owner's equity also has other names. They also, it's also known as uh, paid in capital, capital stock, capital contributions. All these names, if you hear of any of these names, this basically means owner's equity. So this is one, one form of investing, guys, okay? When invest in business, investing in business can only be cash, can only be owner's equity. Or can only be basically reliability, basically, you know, when you borrow money from someone, when you borrow, when you use your own money as the owner's business, that is owner's equity, or it could be capital stock, capital paid in capital, yeah? Those, those all kind of names. Okay. Another way of investing in, in business is basically, uh, which business generates income is makes profit. Obviously, the income, when business makes profits or income, all these belong to the owner, owner of the business. So owner can do basically what they like with it. They can you know, go crazy, you know, they can treat themselves, they can maybe go on to a luxurious holiday in a yacht somewhere, they can buy a sports luxurious car like Lamborghini or something. Okay, we made profit. And if they take the money out, they pay themselves, they are considered as dividends. If they are clever, they are intelligent, they like to they like business to grow, they can reinvest the money in the business, which will be considered as retained earnings, you know, and then basically money will be reinvested in business, yeah. So, so they, they, they can make more money in future. Or they can even with this money which they reinvested, they can buy other new building for the business, new equipment, new shelves, new sort of uh, fix and fittings, anything basically to enhance the business performance. Let's say, you know, we take example of uh, PDQ machines, a PDQ machine where you pay with credit card. I was working for Jaju Armani and they had two hotels in London uh, back in, you know, uh, about late 90s. At that time, the London Metropolitan Hotel, this they had the, the credit card system in their, uh, in their what you call it, uh, keyboards, you know, keyboard for, for computers. Uh, in the keyboard, basically, you know, you basically, you, you, slide, you slide the card through in the front and you used to take the money. Uh, and then at that time, it was quite fast, but before that, you know, when we went to PDQ machine, we paid a, a shopkeeper and the PDQ machine will say dialing, I look at it again after a few seconds and say, darling, darling. It used to take an average of two to three minutes. And then by the time you paid it, there'll be a long queue behind you. But can you imagine if a company, if another company you go to, another shop you go to, and they have a very sophisticated machine, you touch and go, you know, touch and go. And then in two seconds, payment has gone through. You say, that's why you got a selection number, you're free. Would you go back to a game where it said, darling, darling, or would you like to save your time and go somewhere where? Yeah, it's, it's all about uh, merchant solutions. So this is how we need to reinvest money in, in business. So business looks good in front of the customer's eyes. Customers these days, you know, they are very choosy because there's so much competition, guys. So we need to make sure we enhance our business. We enhance the way business is run, okay? Okay, so see if I think uh, it's, we already done more than an hour. Uh, can imagine if we had covered two, two other financial reports as well, they'll be taken forever. So we can do yeah. one at a time, I think. So I will say, any questions, guys? Any question anyone has? Is any post there? If you have not before, most, please feel free to leave. Most questions. of the people, most of the people are saying hello, hi, rather than asking a question. But that's quite normal. You know? Okay. If you think of a question later on, guys, I'm more than happy to answer the question for you. Leave me a note there under the under, under the video link, and I'll be happy to answer you or maybe send you a message back. You know. Uh, uh, we also got so, some uh, social media links as well. You can send us a message there if you like. Thank you, Ratsa, for today. It was a very enjoyable session. At least I enjoyed it. And um, at the time, there were 25, 30 people watching at the time. I'm sure they would have enjoyed as well. It was quite informative and it was a quite revealing for me as well after such a long time, uh, after being away from accountancy. Uh, studies there, you know, for the years there. Uh, my domain is a digital marketing and artificial intelligence, but never said that you're never away from accountancy. That's the way you practice every day, you know. See, to see, by I actually had promised, you know, that my course will ever be understood by housewives. If somebody is housewife, they also will be able to understand it. It's not even, you know, somebody who has a self made person or even one solo trader, solo trader will also be able to understand it. It's not difficult, though. That's People right. are just afraid of it. I thought, you know, it will make it so simple. I mean, and you can understand how it is. That's because most right. of the time when you own a business, you have to do most of the things yourself. 
Yeah, I know that. And we do it every day. It's just that we have to be a proper organized in accountancy, like you said, that uh, have a proper system. If uh, you don't need a sophisticated uh, software or a sophisticated uh, computers to do it, you can just do it. Um, there are plenty of good apps available on your smartphone these days, you know. Excellent. That's right. Thank you, Rasa, for today. Any other uh, thoughts you want to discuss it before I say goodbye to you and concluding remarks? No, thanks for including me in the, in the post, uh, Joseph. And it was a uh, pleasure again to be with you. And hopefully, we'll do it again in the future. And you know, I'm very glad during the COVID-19 lockdown, we're helping people. We make we know sort of we, we're at least being useful to them. That's correct. Yeah. Um, all the audiences who are listening and who had listened part one, part two, and now final part three uh, of that. The, uh, the thought behind uh, delivering this course is to get uh, you some information. I know most of us uh, are not inclined towards accountancy. That's uh, that's all right. Uh, it's, it's a very specialized subject. But having said that, it's, it's, a, it's something I discussed in uh, episode one, that it is uh, a career to recognize or career you could, uh, for especially young one who, uh, who have done just recently A levels or living cert in Ireland, that uh, we these days have a lot of a pressure. Those I'm mean, talk about we. I'm talking about the young students there. That you know you need to go to do the uh, uh, the MBBS like a doctor, or you have to be uh, the do the biomedical the sciences. These are very quite gone. Or even for the matter of fact, as I gave an example of my daughter uh, in law and um, and business there or law itself there. These are the quite four or five there uh, domain and then another domain which is is a software engineering but having said that there are plenty of other domains there which needed to be explored accountancy is there i don't know how many years a million years before people used to do so like rahat sub explained very detailed that how used they used to do the accountancy it's not a new thing it's only thing is that no firm can survive without an accountancy practices you need to have a proper accountancy practice. And when you need a, a accountancy practices for yourself, for your, um, uh, what you say, the stakeholders, as well as for the government, then there is a need of an accountant. And when there is a need of an accountant, there will never be a shortage of uh, this profession in life. That's my thought process. Any concluding remarks uh, before we say goodbye to the viewers? Yeah, so see, basically what I'd like to say, you know, if. Uh... So accounting has two uses. One use, if you are an accountant yourself, you're working, uh, providing a service. But another other use is if you are a business owner, if you understand basic accounting, it'll definitely help you to understand your reports. If, if you have an accountant working for you, you can still see at least the reports there, you know, what, what's, going, what's going on. You can, you can read financial reports and make sense from them. If you're working in a company as marketing, for example, or maybe in HR, you will have to come across accounting because we deal with accounting on a daily basis, you know, personal life too, and also in, in business life. So this course will help people, you know, to make sure they understand, they have some understanding, some sort of logical sense in their mind of what basically, you know, things, how things work. So they won't be totally afraid of it, you know, when they see some report of accounting, oh, no, no, I don't know. Keep it away from me. They can at least understand and they'll make sense from it. That's the whole idea to bring this course in. That's right. And from all of us, uh, from Creative X and Bing Guru, one thing I want to do is that we will keep on pro, um, uh, give, giving you from, from the uh, from the efforts of the experts, uh, some new courses. The next course, which I have uh, online course in my mind, is a lot of a people asking me. I want to have a help with my CV or curriculum vitae or resume. So this is something I'm working out at the moment. There with a couple of people there. I'll see with Rahat Sab as, as well because he's a corporate trainer. If we could do a live sort of a workshop uh, where you could, would come in and see your uh, show us your cv at the moment what what format it is like when i say about format it's not uh, about it's that on our word or, or it's a pdf i want to see how good it is and then we will help you in that workshop to correct your cv to a level where it is acceptable by a majority if not all of the good uh, or corporate organization thank you very much there i'll see you next time very soon there thank you take